Well, let's go to the word of the Lord. Let me invite you to stand for the reading of the word. And we'll begin in 2 Chronicles chapter 5 and going into verse 11. It says, The priest then withdrew from the holy place. All the priests who were there had consecrated themselves regardless of their divisions. It didn't mean they were divided and fussing and fighting, but they had different divisions, how they served and operated. And uh, then it said, all the Levites who were mu musicians, Asaph, Haman, Jed Jeduthun, and their sons and relatives stood on the east side of the altar, dressed in fine linen and playing cymbals, harps, and lyres. They were accompanied by 120 priests sounding trumpets. Now, let me pause a moment and make you see how the Bible correlates all the way through itself, and we're talking about the presence of the Lord coming into, into the temple. I want to take you, and we'll go there in just a little while, to Acts chapter 2. There were 120 priests here sounding the trumpets, and it's significant that he brought this number out because on that day there were 120 people in the upper room and, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 13 out of chapter 5, the trumpeters and singers joined in unison and as with one voice to give praise and thanks to the Lord. Accompanied by trumpets, cymbals, and other instruments, they raised their voices in praise to the Lord and sang, going into the second portion of this scripture, He is good. His love endures forever. Then the temple of the Lord was filled with the cloud. You see, they had to come together in unity. They came together worshiping. They came together in the right numbers. They came together and the temple was filled with the cloud, which is the presence of the Holy Spirit. Verse 14, and the priest could not perform their services, which uh, most translations literally say they could not stand, and so the original Hebrew correlates. They could not stand because of the cloud of the glory of the Lord filled the temple of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your spirit who is real, who is alive, who is present and dwells within us. We thank you for this day, this day of rejoicing, this day, Father, that we surrender and, and devote our lives unto you, Father. This day, as every day, Father, we pray your will be done. I pray that you would cause and allow your spirit to move and minister across this house, to stir every heart to minister to every soul and show forth your glory, your honor, and your praise, we ask in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Amen, you may be seated as we give him praise. Praise God. Now, I want to take you back to chapter 5 and verse 14 that we just read. The priest could not stand because of the glory of because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the temple. I want to show you something. We are living in a day when mankind tries to water down the Word of God and tries to water down the truth of God. And just as we expressed last week, that, and as we ministered on healing, there are more people who would like to tell us what God cannot do rather than telling us what God can do. And God is still healer today. We saw that evident in the service this past Sunday night, and many testimonies came forth through the week following that service. He is still healer. He is still God. He is still the same today as he was then. The Bible says Jesus Christ is the same today as well as yesterday, as well as forever in the future. He is the same, and he doesn't change his mind and do things one way and then do things another way. Now, today they try to water things down, and, and so through all the years, and, and I, somehow I got this in by mistake. I did not intend to get this particular translation in this place this morning as I was reading but it said the priests could not perform their service. That is not in the original Hebrew. 
In the original Hebrew, it says they could not stand because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the temple of God. They literally, physically could not stand in the presence of God. It was more than just saying, I can't perform my duty because there's a cloud. And it seems to be conveyed in this translation, maybe that... Uh, it was just too cloudy. That was not the case. The presence of God was so thick and so dynamic and moving in their midst that they could not even stand up, much less perform what they were wanting to do. Can you imagine if, can you imagine as, can you imagine when the Spirit of the Lord moves in this place and it's so powerful, you just literally begin to fall on your knees or even fall prostrate on your face before the Lord and worshiping and ministering to Him. I'm praying for such moves of God in our midst, whether it's in this house, amen, or in the privacy of your home, or as you're driving your car. There's been many times I was driving my car down the highway and the presence of God coming in so strong as I'm worshiping and I'm praying, I literally have to pull over, stop the car, and just begin worshiping the Lord and even weeping before the Lord because I can't do anything else. I remember, and I'm sharing this as testimony, and I know that there are some that, that just do not, they just refuse to believe such things as this. Let me tell you why. Some people believe that God cannot exist outside of their own experience with Him, that God does not perform in ways outside of the ways they have experienced seeing and feeling and knowing Him. But let me tell you, God is not limited by your thoughts, by your expectation, by your experience, by your wants or diswants. God is not limited. He will work and move in the way that He so desires, and He will show Himself glorious and mighty and strong as we look to Him with great expectation, anticipation, trusting that He be present and work and minister in our lives. God is not dead. God is still alive today. Amen. They literally could not stand. I shared this testimony recently. It may have been last Sunday morning. But the day I surrendered and answered the call to preach, as the Lord had called me at, at, in my senior year of high school, and I was 18 years old. And through the week of the Christmas holidays, he was calling and speaking to me. And, and I was... I was not respond I was responding, but it was negatively. I was not yielding and not surrendering and, and saying no, no. And and then it seemed like he, he kind of left me and, and I didn't have that sensation after that week. But then the Easter uh, we called it Easter uh, vacation. Uh, we, it, we always took off at Easter for a week when I was in school. Now they call it spring break and they go down to the Gulf and party. We called it Easter vacation or Easter break because we were taking that week off in favor of what Christ done on the cross through Passover and it honored him. Today, they don't do that. Today, they want a spring break and spring away from everything and go down and do party or whatever they do. It's just becoming something, a craze in our nation today. Let me tell you, I don't, I don't mind, and it's not whether I mind or not, I don't mind you taking a vacation or a trip, but there should be days and times and weeks and seasons in our lives that we are sanctifying and separating unto God, drawing nearer unto God in hope, and as He will, in hope that He will draw near to us. Do you believe anything like what I'm saying today? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Guys, you will not stand, you will not bear up to anything less than experiencing God in your life. So there's two times you won't stand. One, when you're apart from God, you do not have the strength to stand. When you draw near to God into His literal presence and in holiness, and it is so overwhelming and overpowering, there will be times you have to bow. You just have to fall. There will be times that you experience, I've experienced those times where, where I was in the, in the house by myself, in the church house praying, and, and it was so powerful. I just fell prostrate, and I would just lay there, and, 
and just praying or speaking in tongues. You know, that's something the world wants to tell you that you can't do today. The world, and I'm talking about the, the world in the church, they want to tell you tongues are not for today. I like Paul. He said, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than you all. He said, I'm not ashamed. I'm not embarrassed. He said, I do it. It's nothing to be ashamed about. When you allow God to work and move in your lives, there is nothing to be ashamed about that. But because somebody places a sense of a stigma on it, I grew up in the season, in the years where they said that if we spoke in tongues, those that spoke in tongues were just a bunch of illiterate people. In fact, I grew up through the era, and they still say it today, that those who speak in tongues are demon-possessed. Listen, guys, they will all, there will always be someone to discredit you because they want to discredit God. There will always be someone to demean you because you are experiencing something different than they have. But it's the Word of God that is true, and it is more true than anyone else's experience. But what that is based on most of the time is not someone's experience, but rather their inexperience because they have not sought God for more of what God promised that he would give. Amen. Does that make any sense at all? Bruce Gregory was with us last Sunday evening and helped me minister and serve ministry. He sent me this in a text, and this was a portion of what he sent. He said the point is that God actively demonstrated his power in undeniable ways that are beyond human capabilities. Let me read that again. I really like this, and there's more. The point is that God actively demonstrated his power in undeniable ways that are beyond human capabilities. If if your experience with God is limited to your experience as a human being, then you may not even really actually know God. Amen. And you know what I'm saying. You have to agree with what I'm saying. You cannot take your sins away, but God can and God does. And you've already, through salvation, experienced a power of God manifested and working beyond your human capability. Why not expect him for more? Why not expect him to do everything that he has promised? And then Bruce continued, these demonstrations of the Lord's involvement with the prophets. And I added chosen leader, or I added prophets and chosen leaders. He said these demonstrations of the Lord's involvement with the apostles and ministry were normal and expected. So let me ask this question, guys. When is, is, is the day, will the day come? When is the day coming? Will the day ever come that you expect God to work and perform miraculously in your life, doing things that you've not seen done before, doing things that only He can do, and expect them as being normal? as being anticipated. Amen. I believe every day we should be expecting God to show himself as God in our life. He's not the God of a Sunday. He's not the God of the Sabbath. He's not the God of just the moment when we pray. He is God at all times. And his spirit is real. And his spirit is as real as everything that it says in the Bible. Amen. Amen. And then the Old Testament, when he came in, he came in and it was like a cloud filling the whole room. That, that evening, it was on a Thursday evening during Easter break in 1973. I don't remember the date. And I went down. Uh, we had this station, an old, old station my dad had. And and that's where we lived also here, where the old Hess hamburger place is. And, uh, and I left there late one evening because the Spirit had been convicting me all through the week as I was working. And I went down to the little old rock church down on Main Street and went in. No one was there. 
And uh, that was back in the days when we never locked the doors. We left our musical instruments inside, and, and we just felt like if anybody wanted to come in and pray, they should be able to. And I went down there and began to pray as an 18-year-old teenage boy. And I began to surrender my life and unto the call that God had upon me. And as I began to pray, there was something. It was like smoke. It, didn't, it did not smell like smoke. But there was something like smoke and shadows, and the light was very dim, and I could see the shadows, and it was moving around like a cloud, and the presence of God was so powerful and so dynamic. I just fell down where I was in that aisle, on my knees, on my face, and then I just laid out, as some describe as being just prostrate, laid out on the floor, and just enjoying the presence of God. In fact, it was so dynamic, I don't know if I could... If, if I would have described it at that moment as being so pleasant, but it was powerful, and God was showing me and affirming to me His power and the reality of His call, and I could do nothing less but lay there and just surrender to the call, knowing that God had a plan for me and that He would be with me for as long as I endeavored to answer that call. And it was moments like those, praise God. It was moments like those that has caused me to endeavor to answer the call and never sway from it, knowing, sensing, and feeling the reality of God. If you cannot, if you cannot feel God, how do you know he's real? You can't see him, but you can feel him. You can feel his presence when the spirit moves this is the title of my message when the spirit moves heaven and earth are shifted in Ezekiel 43 and verse 5 it says then the spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court the inner court of the temple and the glory of the Lord filled the temple all through the Old Testament you keep seeing where he filled the temple. And this is, this is, uh, this, I'll, I'll explain it here in just a little bit. He filled the temple. He filled the temple. In Haggai 2 and 7, he says, I will shake all nations, and the desired of all nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. He was referring to the temple in that moment, but it was prophetic of our day and time. And he's talking about his house. And I'll elaborate on that in just a moment. So, as we give you the meat of the word, that means deeper things than the word. Uh, first, we give you the bread, and then we give you the milk prior to that. We start out little by little feeding you and just helping you learn to eat and digest, devour and digest the word of God like you would a meal. I want to show you. You are the temple of God. Amen. It's not just this house. He wants to fill this house with his presence. But you are the temple and you are the object. You are the temple of God. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 16 says, Don't you know that you yourselves, you yourselves are God's temple and that God, God's spirit lives in you? Amen. So how can you know his spirit lives in you if there is not evidence of his spirit living in you? And there are different ways of evidence being manifested knowing that he lives in you. You see, you can't even be saved according to the book of Romans in chapter 4, chapter 8. You cannot even be saved unless the spirit comes into you. He comes in at salvation then you can be filled with the Spirit, and then there's a baptism of the Holy Spirit. Do you not, or don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit lives in you? Verse 17 says, If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is sacred, and you are that temple. Amen? Doesn't that make you just want to sit there and be real quiet? Listen, guys, there's got to be something in the Word of God that makes us want to shout 
This is the word of God. This is the promise of God. This is reality. This is what God desires and what God wants. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is sacred. Now, let me say, this means a lot of things. It may mean don't destroy yourself, but it also means don't destroy one another. Don't destroy one another. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is sacred, and you are that temple. Verse 19, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? The temple, the dwelling, and every place in the Old Testament where it talked about the Spirit coming into the temple was prophetic of what he wants to do through you. I want to follow the leading of the Lord. There are people here. One of them is back here teaching children this morning. There are people here that God is finally bringing out what he has had inside of you for so, so long. And I believe speaking prophetically, and when I call someone, I never want to make you feel awkward or ill at ease. And so if I speak over someone and it comes to pass to God be the glory, if I speak over someone and it doesn't, don't, don't look down on them. Look at me. But Jennifer, I believe that God has something inside of you that he placed inside of you. I don't know how long it's been there, but maybe a long time. And it's going to come out a gift. It's going to come out publicly. It's going to manifest maybe not today or tomorrow. It is manifesting now, but it's going to come forth more and more making you the display of his splendor. I believe this is a word that God has for me to give to you, and it will be beyond what I said. Amen. Amen. And I believe that's happening in many of you, and if you are sitting here and saying, oh, I wish that would happen to me, it's probably because you have that desire, and as you seek him and, and yield to him more and more, it's going to happen to you more and more and more. There's not one of you that has, a, not me included, there's not one of us, in here that has everything that God wants for us. Not one. There's not one of us in here that's experienced everything that God wants us to experience. Let me say it this way. There's not one of us in here that has experienced the fullness of God the way God wants us to experience him because, now how do I say it? Neither, this is how I'm supposed to say it, neither has God experienced in you everything that he wants to experience. Amen? Does that make any sense? So let me say it this way, and then you will, it will have more clarity. There is not a person in here that God has got to experience with, to experience inside to the fullness of his capacity and the way he desires because not, there's not one of us that has experienced God in that way and it's up to us. Do you want more of God? Draw near to him. Do you want more of God? Seek him. Do you want more of God? Believe him. That's the secret. Believe him. And when I talk about commitment to the cause and commitment to the church, let me explain something. The Bible does say there's one body. There is one body in Christ. There's one body on this earth. And many times we call it the church, but there's no place that God says there's one church. And that's what I hear preached constantly. Oh, there's only one church, and you're the church. No, the Bible says there's only one body of Christ, and that encompasses around the world. But did you know there's somewhere between, and I forget the number, between 13 or 17 different churches mentioned in the New Testament there's a church is an entity. This is a church. And it's different than many other churches. Whether it's, it's on a higher spiritual level or a lower spiritual level, I'm not going to try to describe. But this is a church. We call it a body, but this is not the body of Christ. The body of Christ is much bigger than this. This is a church. 
God wants to fill this church with his spirit. He wants to saturate this church. He wants to do it to you individually. But there's something about us allowing God to do it corporately through the body that this church begins becomes a light to this world. Amen. This church is supposed to be a light to the world. Whenever he spoke to the different churches, he applauded a couple of them and he corrected all of them, all but one. He corrected, and I'm talking about the seven churches in the book of Revelation. He would correct them, he might applaud them, but he spoke differently to every church. And guys, this is why I preach the way I do. I want to lead this house in the way that is godly and holy and making a difference. When I talk about commitment, and I said all of that to bring this forth. When I talk about commitment, I'm talking about devotion to the cause. When I talk about devotion to the cause, I'm talking about commitment to the ministry of this house. It's not something that we just do every other Sunday and we come and, and we leave when we feel like it and, and we're, we're always out doing something, you know. Uh, I am aware that there are some that is looking for uh, and they'll travel near and far looking for a different message, looking for something different, maybe a different worship, looking for something different. But God wants us to be committed into one body. And, and let me say this, if, they, if somebody wants to leave this house, if you want to leave this house, that's up to you. I bless you. If you go for a cause, if you go with perp on purpose and with devotion, but just to wander and, and squander your life and wander here and there, that's not God's purpose. That's not God's cause. God has a purpose, a place to plant you. He calls you the planting of the Lord. He, called, he didn't say you're the roaming of the Lord. He calls you the planting of the Lord where you can make a difference, where you can have roots planted and fruit come forth, and it makes a difference right where you live. Amen. 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 Praise God. Well, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God lives, God's spirit lives in you? Verse 17. If anyone destroys, we read that. Verse 19. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You have to receive him, and you are not your own. Verse 20. You were bought with a price, therefore honor God with your body. And with your body, allow the Spirit to live and to dwell within you and to minister through you. The temple of the Old Testament was a, an example of the house God wants to dwell in, and you are that house. You are that house. You are that house. Amen. In 1 Kings 8 and 10, it said when the priest came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord. God wants us to go into the holy place and receive, receive the fullness of the Spirit. Sometimes he is described as a cloud. Sometimes he is described as fire. Sometimes he is described as wind or breath. The Holy Spirit is described in so many different ways in so many different places because it's hard to define him. It's hard to define the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, God said that his ways are above our ways and his thoughts are above our thoughts. And it's because it is so spiritual. So the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. And so when I talk about these experiences, somebody would rightfully so ask, Preacher, are you telling us we have to experience the same thing you experienced? I don't believe that. I believe that we all, many of us share many of the same experiences while many others share many other different experiences. But they are profound. They are very profound experiences in the presence of God. It's not something that is just of the natural, something that we would just say is 
has been normal in our life. When I quit walking the path of darkness and began walking the path of light, surely, surely the scenery was different. Surely the atmosphere was different. Certainly my focus was different. The destination was not pretty that way, but this way it's a beautiful destination. If there's something not different in your path, you're, you've never changed paths. If there's not something different in your experience, you've never changed experience. You've never changed direction. I'm talking about drawing nearer to God and letting Him draw nearer to you. Amen. So what I would say is, never seek an experience. Never seek an experience. Never say, well, Pastor, you described something I would like to experience. I think I'll seek that experience. Never seek an experience. You may fabricate something in your mind, and it's not what is real. Never seek an experience. Only seek God. There are some that I counsel, when I, they talk to me like this, and I counsel them, and they say, oh, we're praying that we can speak in tongues. I, I tell them, don't seek, don't pray that way. Don't pray that way. Just ask God to fill you with the Spirit and baptize you with His Spirit. Just ask God to come in and do more and more. Don't seek for tongues. Don't seek, don't say, God, I want to go lay hands on somebody and then be healed. No, just pray. I want more of your Spirit. I want more of you. And instead of saying this... <coughs> God, I want you, I want to go lay hands on somebody and heal them. Just pray that they're healed. Don't, don't, it's not about you. I guess that's where I'm trying to go. It's not about you. It's not about your experience. And I rarely share, I did recently once, and today I rarely share uh, a lot of times things that I've experienced. It's been rare, and I think I've done it a couple of times recently. It's rare that I talk about that evening late, that night, when I was there at the Little Rock Church all by myself in the, that cloud, and, and we would describe it as a cloud of glory because there are others who have experienced it, and, and there's been some that experienced it in, in, a, in the congregations where everyone saw and experienced it. Never seek the experience. Seek God. Never, never seek uh, a result, just pray or speak the result. Don't say, God, I want to heal somebody. It's not about you. But pray for somebody to be healed. Pray for somebody to be blessed. Pray for, it, it's not you, it may come through you, but I, I don't know if I'm making myself clear or not. I think I'm trying to clarify, don't, don't seek an experience. Seek God. Seek His Spirit. I want more of you, Father. Every day I'm praying, I want more of you. Every day. I speak in tongues every day. I pray every day. I speak in tongues in prayer every day. I don't do much just openly and publicly. Uh, when I'm right there standing and worshiping, I'm standing there and speaking in tongues. Uh, just, well, I don't, I, I, I speak in tongues, I worship, I sing, and I'm praying and just letting the Spirit lead me. Nobody, probably nobody's hearing me speak in tongues. If they do, it's rare. I'm not trying to make a display of myself, but when it comes to the manifestation of the power of God working something in our midst, then God makes it evident and God makes it known. Father, I pray right now that you would cause my words to be effective because I feel like, Father, I'm not saying them with the greatest clarity, but your spirit is the spirit that reveals truth. And I pray that you would settle comprehension and understanding in your truth right here, right now. Thank you, Father. Ephesians 1 and 3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. That is a profound scripture. And this word heavenly realms speaks of a spiritual arena where explosive activity, spiritual activity is taking place. And, and 
interactions and battles which affect our physical reality. We must remember the unseen realm because he said he has blessed us in the heavenly realms. We must remember that the unseen realm, and that word means kingdom, affects what occurs and takes place here. That's why we pray thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And this heavenly realm comes from the Hebrew or the Greek word epiraneus, which is, it says above the sky where heaven and earth meet, where heaven and earth meet. Guys, this is where God sets us, where heaven and earth meet. He sets us there where heaven and earth meet so we can be above, above the troubles and the trials. We're seated, we're resting, we're positioned, we're placed above all these things where heaven and earth meet. I don't know what that does to you, but it, it gets me excited every time I read the scripture. There's so much more to say. Acts 17 and 6, the disciples were accused of being, in Acts 17 and 6, those who have turned the world upside down have come here too. And that word going into the original Greek writing where it takes the conglomeration of who have turned the world upside down, it means to drive out of home and to disturb. They turned the world upside down because of their doctrine, because of the power of the Spirit of God, because of what they had in Christ. I want to very quickly and very briefly give you six things that took place in their life that caused this testimony to spring forth that they turned the world upside down. One, they had an activated faith, not just a faith that was dormant and complacent, but an activated faith. Two, they had unlimited power, and it was the power of the Holy Spirit working within them. They had that unlimited power, and so do you when you realize it and yield to it. They had effective evangelism on that first day about 3,000 souls were added to the church. They had a communicable, communicable commitment. What they were committed to, they could communicate. They had that ability, that anointing. They had a sacrificial love, the same love that was found in Christ when he died on the cross. There is only one kind of that type of love, and it comes through Jesus, and it says we love him because he first loved us. They had that kind of love, and you do too. We just need to, we just need to let it be a sacrificial love that we serve others and we bless others and we encourage others. And lastly, they had a purpose for living. When the Spirit moves, this earth and heaven is shifted. When the Spirit moves, let me invite you to stand. When the Spirit moves, Jesus will rock your world. Jesus will change your life. Amen. He will shift you and move you in ways that you've never been shifted and moved before. This is what I pray for in this church, in this ministry, that we'll be filled with the Spirit, that we'll be baptized in the Spirit, that we will be used by the Spirit, that the gifts of the Spirit will operate in our lives, not just here in this building for show, but as we serve ministry wherever we go. I spoke a word of, that I believe is prophetic by the Spirit of God a moment ago to Jennifer. I do that more outside of the church than I do it inside of the church. That's where our ministry is supposed to be taking place. Guys, I want this church to be a place where the Spirit can move freely. I want, I want us as God's people to be the kind of people that he can flow through and move through. And I preach this this morning to encourage you. Let's seek God. Let's seek God. Let's seek God not for the sake of saying we had a great service this morning, 
but for the sake of drawing nearer to him that he's able to empower us and to use us for the display of his splendor, for the display of his glory. Let's pray. Father, thank you today for your goodness and for your love. Thank you for your presence. Father, thank you for your word. I believe every bit of it, Father. I believe that, as you had stated prophetically in the Old Testament, I believe the book of Haggai. Father, where you said the glory of the latter house will be greater than that of the former house. And we see certainly that when the new church, when the early church was founded, that the glory manifested in the early church was greater than any glory manifested in the temple prior. And we see, Father, in the last days and beginning, Father, a century ago and more, we began seeing again a revival of the working of your Spirit across our land and across this world. Phenomenal things taking place and people drawing near to you and seeking you. And I believe as the, as the day approaches for your return, Father, I believe, Father, that the glory of this latter day will be greater than that of the former. Let your spirit be poured out in this place. Let your spirit be poured out and minister to every heart, to every life, to every soul. Father, I trust you. I bless this house. I bless this house. Father, as we hunger and thirst after you, in Jesus' name, amen. Guys, I love you, and he does too. He wants to show the display of his splendor, the display of his glory through you more than you desire him to do so. Amen, that's just the way he is. His ways are above our ways. If there's anyone here this morning that does not know Jesus as your Savior, I would like to lead you in this prayer. You accept Christ as your Savior, and the way you accept Him as your Savior is by making Jesus your Lord. And that's a prayer that we can pray every day. But I would like to lead you in that prayer. And someone watching through Facebook, through the Internet, through YouTube later, will want to pray this same prayer. And so I want to lead you in that prayer. The way you accept Christ as Savior is by making Jesus your Lord. If you'd like to pray that prayer, then follow with me. Heavenly Father, I believe that you are God and you are my God. I acknowledge you today. I believe that you're the creator of heaven and earth. You're the God of eternity. You're the lover of my soul. I believe that Jesus Christ is your son, your only begotten son, whom you sent to this earth through a virgin named Mary. He came as a baby and became a man. And then he gave himself, his life, as a sacrifice, Father, that we may be saved by the shedding of his blood that our souls may be cleansed, our sins washed away. You said life is in the blood. He shed his blood and gave his life so that we could be washed by that blood and receive life. I accept Jesus as my Savior, and I make Jesus my Lord. Jesus, you are my Lord. Father, I will serve you all the days of my life. Forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me from every one of them. Deliver me from my shame, that which caused guilt and, and embarrassment. Take it all away, Father, and heal me from my pain, that I may walk in wholeness and freshness of life. You are my God. Jesus is my Lord. And I surrender to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you believe that, give him praise. If you prayed that prayer, give him praise. He is the lover of your soul. We love you. God bless you.